Warning, warning, this podcast contains spoilers. Listen at your own risk. Welcome to Medium Shift, the podcast that investigates how stories stack up from medium to medium through the adaptation process. This episode, we're continuing our search into the Arrowverse with Arrow Season 3 and 4. Welcome to Medium Shift. I'm Chris. And I'm Ev. And this episode, we are, as we mentioned, continuing our uh, discussion of the CW TV series Arrow in Season 3 and Season 4. I'd highly recommend, if you haven't already, listening to our previous episode, because a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about uh, really won't make a lot of sense if you have some sort of basis in where we're coming from based on Season 1 and 2. So that being said, uh, moving into Season 3 and 4... Would you want to cover the general description or shall I? So I'll quickly discuss uh, season three and then you can bring up season four while I go cry in a corner. Sounds fair. All right. Season three essentially is Green Arrow, or still Arrow at this point, takes on the League of Assassins after the death of Sarah, the original Canary. Mm. And season four involves uh, the emergence of someone related to the League of Assassins called Damien Dark, who comes in to basically destroy the world as well as a bunch of other things that the season focuses on that we will get into that we largely don't like. And my hopes and dreams. And his hopes and dreams. Just good yeah, destruction yeah. of everything that I love about this show. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> kind of piggybacking on what we were talking about regarding the preview episode, where we thought season one was like a good, decent start, and then season two was a really significant improvement on that first season. Season three and four are much more of a mixed to negative bag. To put it yes. kindly, shall we say. Let's let's start with season three at the very least, because that's more manageable to talk about before uh, Evan gets into a really deep, dark well of depression, which he know it, I know he will. Uh, um, what's your opinion on season three then, generally speaking? Season three, I'm actually quite fond of. Really? Uh, I've got a major problem with it okay. that spans across both seasons that I'll bring up later. Mm-hmm. But the very first nine episodes, aside from... The death of Sarah, I actually find pretty interesting. It promises a lot. Where the, it fulfills those promises is not all that great, but I like that they set all this up mystery with who killed Sarah and the conspiracies and the whole mystery of the League of Assassins, because at this point, you still didn't know a whole lot about them. Mm. And Matt Nabel as Ra's al Ghul, I find, especially in that first half, really compelling. He is so calm and collected, but also has a slight menace about him Mm. that I just find really enjoyable as a villain. Not as good as, say, Manu Bennett as Deathrope, but I'd say close to on the level of Merlin in the first season. Really? Okay, interesting. In the early bits, especially on that episode, The Climb. Sure. Where he's just calm, collected, Mm. and incredibly skilled mm, yeah that is a really good that's the mid-season finale isn't it mm, I, yes. I never remember the episode names but yeah i know what you're talking about that is a, a good solid yeah. episode episode and, nine the climb is where they leave it on the cliffhanger it's following the christmas sort of break right sure yeah no makes sense the mid-season finale basically essentially yeah 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 okay interesting i i am not as fond of season three as you to be honest part of it is for long-standing listeners of this podcast would know I'm a huge Batman fan and the League of Assassins is obviously a very big part of Batman's mythos. And this version of the League of Assassins in Arrow, for me at least, leaves a little bit to be desired. I think Matt Nabel is fine. I don't know if he quite has the physicality of Ra's al Ghul. Yeah, yeah. I think he kind of makes up for it in some level with his performance because I do think there is like he's really great at kind of selling a man who is perpetually calm and in control of Mm. every situation he's in. But I think he's also shackled with some really iffy writing, especially in the second half of the season. Yeah. 
as well as not being... He doesn't feel like the physical threat that I feel like Ra's al Ghul should be, to be honest. Because Ra's al Ghul, or Ra's al Ghul, we'll, we'll get into it, the pronunciation later, but um, has always been like not only an intellectual foe for Batman and the people he's come up against, but also very much a physical foe mm. in the League of Assassins as well. I don't think they quite paid off that in the way. The Climb is, does a good job in that respect. It's probably the closest it, it get to feeling what like true Ra's al Ghul should be, but... That's really all I can say about it. So yeah. I understand. Mm. I did get the feeling, especially with mm. the dialogue in The Climb, mm. that this Ra's al Ghul was meant to be one who's on his way out, mm. especially with the whole bringing in an heir. He's been around for close to hundreds of years. Sure, sure. Uh, they don't explicitly yeah. say it, but they mm. say he, mm. one of the things was like he hasn't been beaten 80 years. And mm. clearly he's not 80. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I can see that impression of the so character. That, okay. yeah. But yeah, you, I agree with the whole second half mm. where it kind of, everything it builds up, it just sort of drops off. Yeah, yeah. It's great build up to a really mm. sort of mediocre yeah. series of climaxes. And after, yeah. the, after the climb, mm. Ryan Zagul stops being as threatening as he had sort of been because now mm. they just keep shoving him in your face. Yeah. He loses all air of a mystery. Yeah. Him, when, if you, when he basically becomes a supporting character, there's mm. really not... Like, as you sort of mentioned, the League of Assassins is sort of this omnipresent kind of scary presence at the beginning of the season and such, but that mystery... Even in the previous season Yeah, as well. in the previous season as well, obviously, but that mystery disappears not only as the season goes on, but the series goes on, because the League mm. of Assassins goes through so many different things in subsequent seasons and such to essentially the point that it's not really anything anymore. Yeah. Like, it ends up being disbanded. Spoiler alert. But, um, yeah. We're going to bring it up anyway, because it gets disbanded in season four, isn't it? I don't quite remember. But, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that either way. But, um... Yeah, the other thing that kind of bothers me about this season is that I once I talked about in regards to season one and two, it's, it feels like season three really doubles down on the soap opera elements of the show, which has always been the half of the show that I didn't like to begin with. Like, even if I tell someone that I enjoy Arrow or I watch Arrow, I always need to preface with, I enjoy half of Arrow. I enjoy, like, the superhero crime procedural comic book side of it and don't care like literally uh i i would fast forward through those scenes sometimes when i was watching it if i got really really sick of it and it really feels like not only in season three but season four as well but there was a doubling down on all the bad soppy soap opera elements that i don't like oh absolutely yeah there was a great little theory i'd say that i read on reddit around this time mm. uh it was near the end of season four to season five and it was essentially saying the reason it doubled down on all this stuff was because they basically condensed the rest of the three to four year plan mm. into two years and replaced Laurel with Felicity in those types of scenes. To appease, appease the shippers. Uh, well, that was one of the possible reasons. They don't, yeah. don't want to cast too much dispersion or judgment on anyone mm. or any part of the fandom. But that whole thing kind of made sense to me where it was just like, because suddenly mm. it was accelerated. There was a lot more of the soap opera stuff and it just went along a lot quicker mm. with clear chops of where oh there should have been more time for this to actually have progressed mm. it almost feels rushed in some respects yeah, yeah. especially with the uh, i know i'm jumping ahead but the season three finale where they're riding off in the sunset all very happy to live a suburban life mm. i feel that would have made sense at the end of like season five of their original plan yeah where it was going from because the original plan was five years of on the island where it goes from being oliver queen to becoming the hood and five years in the present day from becoming the hood to becoming the green arrow mm. and that felt like right enough to the sunset with laurel seemed like the logical conclusion for five seasons but they brought it in at season three mm. way too early basically yeah. and didn't you mention last episode that greg volante who's like the showrunner and the guy who organized that five-year plan, essentially left at the end of season two to oh, start yeah. The Flash, which is almost certainly why things were accelerated and basically chopped together because someone else came in, or someone else who was involved in previous seasons mm. uh, came in as the new showrunner and basically condensed yes. things and started taking things in different directions to where the plan was not originally you know, going to go. Yeah. We're not going to try and mm -hmm. cast illusions on who we think is doing that. There are mm. many possible people who could have affected mm. Arrow over the course of its run, but it's just worth pointing out that as soon as Greg Berlanti left and some of the power was dissipated mm. for uh, some of the other heads of creative, 
including Mark Guggenheim, who did take over as showrunner, mm. who was originally more of the episodic writer, who I thought was actually pretty good mm. in the first two seasons. He directed a couple of decent episodes. Yes. Yeah. But when he was then forced to both mm. work with new producers and new heads and this was when dc was completely sort of trying to build up their live action the dc extended DC universe extend, basically. Yeah. yeah that's a really good point the historical context around it basically mm-hmm. yeah almost shot arrow Noth- in the foot. yeah nothing was going right for mm. those guys honestly so yep. i f- i feel bad but at the same time they also did bring it on season four and i cannot forgive them for that <laughs> yeah exactly if we want to briefly touch on what we think of season four before we start dissecting the elements of season three yeah <laughs> i think our um i i think our opinions are fairly clear at this point and that neither of us like it Although, didn't happen yeah. season four did not happen mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> i don't feel as strongly as you uh in that respect which is funnily enough compared to the rest of the series but yeah it's it's not good in so many respects look i i'm joking when i say it didn't happen there yeah. are actually a few moments that i when i thought okay this is kind of semi-decent mm. but that could also be because everything around it was not great and so it just <laughs> the- anything that looked possibly good was suddenly oh fantastic yeah the bar is so much lower at this yeah. point for quality content leading into season four so but yeah anyway we'll get into that once we actually start dissecting all the elements of season four or what yeah. worked and what didn't in the meantime do we want to move into season three uh absolutely yeah so what have um, you got for us first this time well i thought given everything that happens with sarah and laurel in the season it might be good to talk about the canaries mm. uh the first two spoiler alert <laughs> uh, to take up the role will were of course uh, Sarah Lance and then her sister Laurel Dinah Laurel Lance. Mm. So Black Canary in the comics is very 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 closely associated with associated with Green Arrow mm. because back since the sixties basically they have been a romantic item and they're one of the few comic book couples that manages to last, <laughs> which is incredibly rare. Yeah. It's so much easier to just constantly be cutting out love interests and, you know, killing someone off and fridging, as we've Mm, talked about in previous episodes. But this is, even for someone who is not a fan of Green... Well, not not a fan of Green Arrow in the comics, but just isn't that familiar, I've always been aware of how intimately connected Green Mm. Arrow and Black Canary are as characters, so... We brought up a lot of the comparisons that Green Arrow makes with Batman, Mm. especially in the early comics and in the first season of this show yeah one of the few things that i think differentiates the two of them is interpersonal relationships <laughs> green arrow seems to do a lot better than batman in keeping one his relationships actually liking each other mm. and two keeping them alive <laughs> <laughs> there uh there is that batman has a very choppy history shall we say with love interest to be honest my opinion on all that is a completely mm. another topic for another day but that's a that's a really good differentiating point that i haven't thought about yeah and that uh this feels almost reductive in so many respects but black canary is very much kind of green arrows lowest lane like it's almost sort of the mm. fated love interest in so many respects I- yeah but better than those things, because Black Canary is clearly the one in charge of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. She is the better fighter to the point where a lot of the comics actually had to depower her briefly in order for Green Arrow to actually do stuff. Oh, was that when she lost her canary cry? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Especially around that time. Uh, this was mainly, yeah, 60s, 70s and brought back more around sort of the 90s as well. Okay. Yeah, they were always seen as equals. So, just just of confirmation so, in the comics, have there mm, ever been multiple Black Canaries, like iterations yes. in that way? Right. Uh, okay. So, uh, we'll go. I'll go jump back into the uh, bio mm. of Black Canary. Okay. Originally, the Black Canary was Dinah Drake Lance, and she was part of the Justice Society of America. This mm. was proper early comic book history. This was, I think, she was introduced in 1947. Right. Okay. Yeah. So quite early on. So the original Justice Society, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she wasn't a founding member, but she did eventually become part of that before the full uh, retcons. Then at sort of Infinity Crisis, where during that time before Infinity Crisis, she did strike up a relationship with Green Arrow, the early one as well, and so they've been around. Although they've yeah, so 60s basically is when they 
came together. Mm. Then Infinity Crisis happened. And for those who don't know, Infinity Crisis was one of the big universe encompassing retcons. Do you mean Crisis on Infinite Earths? Or... No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I think you there are watch. multiple crises. Because yeah, sure. there's the Crisis on Multiple Earths, yep. Crisis on Infinite Earths, and mm. then Infinite Crisis. Okay. Okay. I see. I'm getting my um, DC terminology mixed up. Oh, yeah. No, I get confused at the time. There is part of me that is constantly thinking, am I talking about Crisis on Infinite Worlds? <laughs> But basically, it's it was the crisis in where all of the multiverse got mm. condensed into one. Right. Basically. The first time. <laughs> the first time. Yes. Sure, sure. Well, Flashpoint also happened, which did the same thing yes. after they reintroduced the multiverse. and then It happens a lot in DC. Just for general people who aren't fans of the DC universe, it's very frequently happening in the DC continuity yes. where some sort of universe-altering event will happen. And they'll sort of condense and reset continuity. And go on and then, and then mm. things will get too complicated, and they'll just reboot it all over. It's happened, yes. what, six or seven times? I don't know the exact number, but a lot of times uh, throughout There's been a lot history. of soft reboots and about three hard reboots. Right, okay, sure. Uh, soft reboots are things like Rebirth, where mm. the continuity still stays the same, but yep. clearly something has happened that has caused minor altercations. Right, okay. And hard reboots being Flashpoint, mm -hmm. where lots of things changed yep. for permanent. Yeah, yeah, they're basically rebooted most of the universe. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, uh, after this particular crises event, Black Canary stayed as one of the original Justice Society of America leaders, mm -hmm. but she retired, married uh, Larry Lance. Larry Lance. Yes. Detective Lance has had quite a few first names. <laughs> yeah, right. He's been Larry, Kurt, Quentin in this. Mm. Uh, they can never seem to settle on one first name. Whoa, 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 wait, just hold up. So in the comics, Black Canary married the character that would be adapted into her father in the show? Let me. <laughs> so, this is Dinah Drake Lance, the okay. first Black Canary okay. who marries Larry Lance. They run a flower shop together. Oh, cute. Uh, and they retire. They then have a daughter, Dinah Laurel Lance, mm. who then goes on to take up the mantle of Black Canary oh. after her mother and goes on to start a relationship with Green Arrow. Of course. Sorry. Right, right. I see. I'm getting my laurels mixed up. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Too many lances. Yeah. Too many lances. <laughs> okay. So yes, so as I mentioned, Dinah Laurel Lance takes on the role of Black Canary after developing mm. the same metagene as her mother, mm. the organic canary cry, mm. as they call it. She then joins the Justice League, meets up with Green Arrow, they start a relationship, and then Black Canary basically goes on to also be a founding member of the Birds of Prey. The one and only Birds of Prey, Birds of Prey. <laughs> Sorry, continue. <laughs> I don't know if we have to copyright. <laughs> uh, that's a good point, actually. I'll cut that part out. <laughs> I don't know if that song is copyrighted. That's the thing. We'll and save you didn't that to the sing it well enough for it to sound like the original. <laughs> well, sure. I can't sing in an alto, but um, we'll save that for the Brave and the Bold episodes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Continue. So yeah, uh, that's basically a very, very brief history of Black Canary, especially in regards to her links with Green Arrow. Right. They get married. The marriage falls through after it's revealed that she accidentally married a doppelganger oh comics <laughs> but then the marriages still happen oh comics as in she almost dies to the fake green arrow kills the fake green arrow reunites with the original green arrow and then they marry right okay sure so she still ends up being married to green arrow yep yep okay uh, yeah yes. okay. right basically almost every continuity of green arrow and black canary the two end up together yeah usually sure. married it's one of those inevitable things basically yes. yeah okay how exactly does sarah factor into this in so many respects sarah doesn't exist right so yeah. sarah's an original creation for the show as, as, sen as sensibly yes okay uh, there are a few sort of characters they take influence from mm. especially when they bring in like the white canary who was actually a villain of the birds of prey oh really uh, I didn't know that was an actual character. It was very briefly, and okay. no real relation mm. to actually being a superhero or the superhero white canary that Sarah becomes. Mm. But that's where they get the name from, and that association with Laurel comes in through Birds of Prey, and there's a whole thing about that. I can go in, but it'll take ages sure. if I talk sure. too much about it. No, but fair yeah, enough. Sarah is an original character. Right. Yep. So her starting off as the Black Canary trained by the League of Assassins, mm -hmm. all completely new for the show, essentially. Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah, one of the things that the show does get right, it actually, in season three, they have the training by uh, Wildcat. Oh, which yeah. Which is very much the same as Dinah Laura Lance in the comics. Mm, I almost forgot about Wildcat. 
Sarah in this particular continuity doesn't really sort of matter in borrowing from the origin. Laurel always had the same origin as the one in the comics, mm, okay. in that she is trained by Wildcat and her father, who is a detective, mm. although in the comics was also potentially a private eye. It gets a little wishy-washy. Sure, sure. So yeah, TV show comics lined up very well on how Laurel became Black Canary. Yeah, interesting. I even... I even kind of like the whole concept that they kept it as a legacy character. Hmm. The fact that rather than adopting the Black Canary mantle from her mother, she adopts it from her sister in a very Hmm. similar way of trying to live up to someone's legacy, which I think is a really interesting adaptation as well, as well as like, you know, making a new and interesting character in Sarah Lance, because I I think they did fairly a good job with her for the most part. So no, that's interesting. Okay, cool. I am a big fan of Laurel. I do feel there were a few missteps yeah. in her thing, especially when I mentioned the last episode. Her alcoholism. Her alcoholism. Mm. And in this episode, her sort of fascination with trying to bring Sarah back from the dead. But I guess I can't really comment because I've never had the capacity to bring a loved one back from the dead through <laughs> a magical pool. Sure, sure. So maybe maybe that is realistic in that kind of a world. <laughs> maybe that's an authentic motivation. Sure. Yes. I can get that. But yeah. as someone living in this world, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Yeah. Just generally speaking, I, I've forgotten the, the actress's name who plays Laura Lance all of a sudden. Katie Cassidy. Katie Cassidy, that's the one. Yeah, sure. I don't love her, if okay. I'm being honest. I Part of it was maybe largely to do with the fact that in season one and two, she was almost always affiliated with the elements of the show that I don't like, which was the sort of previously mm. discussed soap opera elements and things like that. So there was really just a lot of like significant disinterest in her character when she slowly started to come into her own as becoming black canary in season three and four. And while I don't think she's a necessarily bad actress, I just think she's kind of, she was given a rough hand, I think in some respects in regards to her character, even if it did eventually sort of pay off in a way in season three, when she kind of becomes black canary and season four, we'll leave to later. But, um, I, uh, yeah, to be honest, I've never been a massive fan of her. Uh, part of that is as well, obviously, I don't have the emotional connection to Black Canary as a character that you do, obviously. Yeah. So in many, it's just a name to me. Mm. So I think, yeah, I think she's fine. But I think as you sort of mentioned, she's has she's been through some rough patches in many respects. So. Yeah, she does have a mm. number of detractors who aren't huge fans, especially in those first two seasons. Mm. Uh, I'll even admit that I can see where they're coming from. Although mm. I did quite like... Her performance. Mm. There were times where it did seem a little rough uh, around the edges, yeah. Especially in regards to some of the mm. trying to work with the more soapy dialogue. Yeah, I, I mean, in many respects, I feel like a lot of it isn't even her fault. Oh, no. Yeah, that's why I mean, that's what I kind of mean when I say that she was just dealt mm. a raw hand. It was just, yeah, yeah. She was always kind of going to struggle in that respect, considering her character didn't get to do anything significantly yeah. worthwhile and it was genuinely really unlikable through a lot of season mm. two as well yeah you'd have to be an amazing mm. amazing actor to deal with some of the stuff that she had to go through yeah for and sure. the fact that she did and still provided a, a rock solid performance mm. does speak a lot yeah yeah sure even it, if it isn't a fantastic performance like some of the others yeah sure it's just she was always shackled in that respect i guess yeah on the other on the flip side i do think sarah was quite good as well to be honest oh yeah but that is once again also sort of talking to the fact that she got a much better draw of hands in season two and even leading into season three in some respects as well Mm. uh but and especially now looking forward at the legends of tomorrow where she's done a fantastic job as one of the few remaining members (laughs) of the team (laughs) yeah absolutely so we'll get into legends tomorrow in a later episode but um yeah i i do quite enjoy her considerably more than her sister funnily enough but um yeah yeah. is there anything else you would like to add regarding the black canaries no but we did bring up legends and there is one other character that made their debut in this season who went on to be part of the legends yeah and that is ray palmer the oh Atom. yes right of course <laughs> i had a complete mental blank of you were talking about for a moment there yeah yeah sure the shrinking iron man yes yeah. <laughs> discount blue beetle yeah uh, as he was first known because originally mm. that was who he was meant to be he was meant to be ted cord hence why all the references to the fact that he doesn't actually shrink in the first season Mm. uh, his first season season three this one yeah and the fact that he is basically just building a giant mechanical suit yeah that can sort out his needs very Mm. much like the beetle Mm. in so many respects yeah Yeah, so what exactly is the story behind ray palmer's character so he was initially going to be 
yes. Ted Cord, which for people who don't know is a character in the comics called the Blue Beetle, who basically is just a tech genius inventor who builds devices and suits to help him fight crime, that sort of general thing. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a bit more complicated as the Beetle itself is its own well, creature from Yeah, sure, world. but that's, that's a whole other level of mythology uh, that we don't need to worry about. Yes, but yeah. the very much what Ted Cord shares with TV's Ray Palmer mm. is that very tech savvy genius billionaire, basically. Mm. Yep. You know, DC Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, sure. And they very much kind yeah. of lean into those similarities in this season, so. Absolutely. Yeah. But like we mentioned with the executives trying to set up their DC extended universe and live action mm. retellings, they, at a very late stage, told the creators, no, you can't use Blue Beetle because we're might be using him in the Booster Gold movie. Oh, the Blue Beetle Booster Gold movie that they've been talking about for years that's probably never going to happen. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, of course. They immediately had to make some changes and went, yep, let's go with the other tech genius uh, <laughs> billionaire in the DC universe in Ray Palmer. Yeah. Who isn't really much of a billionaire in the comics. He's mm. just is a part of mm. all of that. Mainly, they focus mainly on the scientist stuff rather than the yeah, mm, yeah, sure. He's kind of business side of things. The easiest people for people who aren't familiar with the atom in the comics is he's very much in many ways just DC's equivalent to Ant Man. Yeah, so he's sort of like you know genius scientist who built some sort of device that allows him to shrink, uses it to fight crime, but is still ultimately a scientist first and foremost. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. He is played in the TV show by Brandon Routh, someone we'll probably talk a lot more in future episodes, especially yes. when we come to Legends. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so we won't bring up too much of him and just the mm. fact that he's there. He's delightful. He is we, absolutely delightful. We can say that at the very least. Yes. Brandon Routh is delightful in almost everything he is in, except for maybe yes. Superman Returns. But um, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. That, that's another episode that will come out in our potential Rathathon. Yes. We love him so much, we will dedicate... Mm. A whole series of episodes <laughs> to him teaser alert but sure yeah yeah oh so. uh, that's just at this point it's confirmed we love him so much that mm. we will eventually don't know when don't know how <laughs> don't know what we're doing mm. but we will be talking about brandon rath a lot more yeah sure yeah he is so in just or just generally speaking in this show he's really good he's yes. really well cast as the atom and he the writing matches with his performance so incredibly well as well like he's i don't know he he kind of lends into he can do the wittiness of the show and his character while also doing the soap opera elements all at the same time, which I think is really impressive yeah. and is hell of a lot better than some of the other people who shackled with this dialogue. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And one of the thing, few things with the soap opera stuff that I know you don't love, mm. he makes it believable. Yeah. <laughs> there are a few issues that I had in this mm. season in regards to like the love triangle that I had going with Mm. Oliver, Felicity, and Ray. Yeah. Ray was the only one I was rooting for. <laughs> and it wasn't to be with Felicity. It was more just to get out of it alive. Yeah, yeah. You just want him to be okay. You yes. want him to be happy. Yes. No matter it, what that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. His character gets a lot of depressive uh, backstory <laughs> and a lot of just bad luck heaped on him. Yeah, that's true. I would, um, in in regards to the melodramatic elements, I would argue that purely by being melodrama, it cannot be accurate, yeah. <laughs> which is a whole other thing. I've actually, I was reading something, um, some sort of academic text about melodrama recently, and the way they kind of characterize it is when the plot uh, or whatever you're watching is just incredibly expressive and detailed in mm. its description of people's emotions. Oh, so, yeah. you know, in a, in a soap opera, people are always talking about their feelings and how people make their feel, and everything is on a surface level, basically, which honestly, in many respects, is the complete opposite to how most human relation works in real life, which is one of the reasons I don't like it, as well as just being really the least interesting part of the show in that respect. So, But it, it, all that being said, he is the guy of the three of them, even more so than Oliver, to be honest, mm -hmm. that I'm like, yeah, I, I, I like you and I want you to be happy, regardless of what that's going to be. Although, mm -hmm. in many respects, that probably just means not even dealing with Oliver or Felicity and just doing your own thing go make your suit and join the legends yeah exactly so um as a decent segue we do eventually need to talk uh about the elephant in the room uh over season three and four evan is giving me a look right now that i'm finding really difficult to decipher you know this is going to happen eventually mm -hmm. but we need to talk about felicity smoke yeah 
Um, so, as far as I'm aware, an completely original character for the show. Yes, the name did actually come from a character in the comics. Oh, I didn't know that. The original character in the comics was an antagonist, a mm. very minor antagonist to Firestorm, mm. who eventually goes on to marry Jefferson's father and become Firestorm's stepmother. Huh. Okay. Yes. And yeah, she runs an electronics store. I think in the comics mm. uh, and is very tech savvy for that period of time. Mm. So that they share with Felicity. Mm. It's about it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It's one of those sort of just name surface takeaways yes. basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But mm. I just find it really interesting that we have a firestorm in this universe mm. and a Felicity smoke and they're in no way related. Mm. That's an interesting point. I didn't even know she was connected at all to firestorm firestorm. Mm. So yeah. In, in many ways, I feel like we should just approach this as an original character. Oh, yeah. so, in all yeah. accounts, she is original aside from name. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it is one of those characters, which we talked about in previous episodes regarding John Diggle, but mm-hmm. it's a character that was essentially originally created to the show that now a lot of people heavily affiliate with the Green Arrow mythos, for better or worse. So she, yeah. like, I'm, I don't know the exact details, but she did show up in an arc in the Green Arrow comics, didn't she? She did. In New 52? Um, yeah. Originally, it was... During the 52, when they brought in Krinsberg, who was one of the show creators, okay, uh, the three sort of main heads of creative for Arrow, being mm. Greg Blanty, Mark Guggenheim, and Andrew Krinsberg. Right. Krinsberg basically took over 52 after its sales started dipping, mm. and they didn't know how to bring it back. So they thought, oh, if we integrate with the show a bit more, might bring in some of the TV audience. It did not work out. Mm. Uh, the people who love the comics hated all the additions. The people who watched the show couldn't get into the comics because it was too different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so no one liked it and it eventually tanked. One of the characters that was brought in during this time was Felicity Smoke, originally as a hacker for hire and essentially to kill Green Arrow. Oh, okay. Uh, she very, very quickly changes her mind and jumps on board with his plan for the very loose reasons <laughs> right uh, at um, least they adapted that from the show fairly well <laughs> yes mm. and yeah and then eventually ends up in an argus prison cell and then gets free but is never heard of again oh cool uh, so, and then rebirth happened and we've not heard from her since sure so it almost certainly she's probably not going to show up in the comics oh and... no they yeah. the audience hated her yeah okay the comic the original comic audience did not mm. like her. Mm. The TV show audience didn't like her representation because it was weirdly different. Mm. And all this random backstory was added. Mm. Uh, she had a link with Cheetah for a while. Right. Wonder Woman supervillain. Okay. They had a past. Never mm. really brought up again because that was very late in her run. And then she disappeared. Cool. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. So maybe unlike John Diggle, she's probably not going to stick around, which no. according to most people uh, is a very... Very good thing, because <laughs> uh, in in many respects, when we do talk about season three and season four, and not only the reception to the show, a lot of the negativity does revolve around this character. It's not even I feel about the character specifically. It's mm-hmm. more she represents everything that is wrong with the show. Right for those three seasons. Okay. Which so yeah, everything that's wrong that like, across the whole board is amplified with her talk about the hypocrisy of the show mm. she is one of the key examples because mm. some of the stuff that happens again i'm relating this back to the fast tracking mm. where she suddenly goes from being fine with oliver to suddenly hating him really closely especially we talked about uh william his son mm. this is further on in season four but just the fact that she immediately ditches him for very loose defined reasons and then they get back together again anyway Hmm. it's very much that hit and miss kind of what are you going with Hmm. the show where is any forethought to any of this right okay so she and it basically the writing ruined her character she is basically the nexus for everything that Hmm. people dislike about the show not even just the soap opera elements and the bad romance and the fact that there doesn't seem to be a plan but just generally bad decisions and poor forethought yeah, am I getting yeah. that right, basically? Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, interesting. Because, I mean, it, the, the arc of Felicity is an interesting one because we briefly talked about it in Season 1 and 2 in that she was generally just a, a light supporting character in Season 1 that people apparently really responded to, which led her to becoming a more prominent role in Season 2 uh, until eventually Season 3 when she basically becomes the main love interest. Fun fact, in my research, actually, I discovered that Oliver and Felicity won the... 
MTV Fandom Awards for Ship of the Year. Did you know that? I had an inkling that this happened. There was a lot of <laughs> these online votes that sort of happened that they got ahead of. Mm. Some of them through less scrupulous methods. <laughs> well, yes, that, that there is were a thing. accusations thrown around of uh, bot yeah. uh, usage. I won't go into that. They do have a significant, mm. very vocal fan base. Yep. I'm not going to try and annoy. We... I see their reasons. I don't agree with them, but I'm definitely not going to get on their bad side. Okay, okay. We we could probably do a whole episode regarding just the fandom around Arrow, to be honest. So let's let's not touch on that if we're going to keep things yeah. focused on the show. But it does really feel like Felicity in many ways uh, represents everything that we do not like in Season 3 and Season 4 in that yes. respect. So, yeah. Yes, although... I do have to say, Emily Bett Records, who plays Felicity, uh, as a person, seems delightful. <laughs> Just following her on social media, she seems like a great person. Yeah, as a normal human being with normal yes. human feelings. Uh, she's, she's fantastic. Yeah, she seems like a lovely individual. <laughs> In fact, she drew the tattoo of my friend. So she actually drew out a design that my friend got tattooed. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. So yes. Oh, huh, okay. Emily Fantastic. Felicity, not great. No, <laughs> not, not so good in many respects. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, her biggest problems, like as you sort of briefly touched on, largely happen in season four. But in season three, you can very much feel the sort of build up to that yeah. in so many respects. Okay, moving on from Felicity, because I'm sure we'll be able to talk about her more detailed once we get into season four. Do yes. we want to touch on the villains for season three at this point? Yes. Which, which is finally a realm that I have some sort of background of interest <laughs> in. Pleasantly enough. So obviously the big bad for the season, as we touched on before, is Ra's al Ghul. One thing I need to get out of the way, which I need to get out of the way every time I talk about Ra's al Ghul, is how his name is pronounced. It technically should be Raish. Based on... Well, there, okay, there's a little bit of contention, because obviously it came out in the comic books, and people don't... People just, you know, interpret... Read. Yeah, mm -hmm. read things very differently in comic books from one person to another. made up words, <laughs> it's made up pronunciation. Exactly. But there is an episode, I believe in Batman Beyond of the TV series, where... Talia al Ghul essentially says that the Western pronunciation of Ra's al Ghul is Ra's al Ghul, where the correct Arabic pronunciation of Ra's al Ghul is Raish al Ghul. So I always try and stick to Raish al Ghul in many respects. Shut up. <laughs> He's pretending to play a tiny little violin right now. I think this is an important detail. This is a That wasn't a violin. I was just scratching myself. <laughs> oh, okay. It looked like you were mocking me for a moment. Oh, uh, I was mocking you, <laughs> oh, okay. but not through a violin. <laughs> Either way, but still, I, I want to get that point out there. So I will say Raza Ghul, even if I personally prefer Raish, because that's kind of how he's how he is pronounced in most media. Mm. Just a small thing. Specifically in this show, yeah. he is known as a Raz. Yeah, yeah. And and in other stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, it, it kind of varies from um, uh, film to film and show to show and so on and so forth. But yeah, I personally prefer Raish. So that's the thing. I just had to get that out of the way. In regards to... So we've sort of touched on this in previous seasons, where Malcolm Millen and Deathstroke, even though they're both original characters from the comics, are very, very different when it comes to their television counterparts in that the basic foundation of the character were there, but they changed a lot of it to make them more, uh, you know, emotionally and narratively connected to Oliver Queen. Ra's al Ghul kind of breaks that chain in that he is really surprisingly quite accurate to the comics in many respects just sort of broadly speaking obviously in the comics Razigul has always had a lot more to do with Batman than he has Green Arrow as far as I'm aware like beyond just Justice League stuff they've never directly tangled as like antagonist and protagonist from what I can no, recall no, not a whole lot no it is linked because in the comics Merlin is mm -hmm. part of the League of Assassins yeah sure and uh, so are a few other Green Arrow villains, mm. but them face to face, not so much. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So this is it's one of those interesting elements that all the connections and overlaps with Batman in season one and two kind of paid off into essentially having a major Batman villain being the antagonist for season three. So broadly speaking, like Razagul in the comics has obviously gone through a lot of iterations, but the general structure of He's been living for hundreds of years because he was a man ages ago who discovered the Lazarus Pit and he's used the Lazarus Pit to stay young. And because of that has basically grown up his influence and wealth into an organization called the League of Assassins that he essentially runs. All of that is essentially basically the same in the comics. His name means the demon's head as well. Mm -hmm. which I believe, it, that's referenced in the show, isn't it? Yes. From what I can recall? Yeah, yeah, sure. Although there is, an, there is an interesting point in the show, which as far as more is quite different from the comics, where Razagul uh, is not his name, but kind of like a moniker. So mm -hmm. whoever is the head of the League of Assassins 
is called Razogul rather than the individual itself being called Razogul. That's not the same in the comics as far as I'm aware. Like other people have taken over the League of Assassins, but they normally maintain their own moniker uh, as far as I can The report. Al Ghul part mm. sort of his family have taken that on as basically part well, of the name. Yeah, sure. Like, well, like Talia and Nisa and such. So yes. Yeah. Uh, Cause Nisa's actual name is Nisa Ratko. Ratko. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Talia. She was Russian in the comics. Yes. Yeah. And Talia has sort of changed mm. uh, names as well. But the Al Ghul part generally stays with their lineage. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But it's not like in say the comics or so no. Deathstroke was to take over the League of Assassins or something. He wouldn't change his name no. to Deathstroke Al Ghul or Raza no. or something like that. So yeah, that it's a small detail, mm. but it's, a, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing to point out. The other thing that is very much taken from the comics, which is uh, almost exclusively affiliated with Batman, but the fact that Raz is looking for an heir to his empire is absolutely a thing that comes up in regards to Batman mm. uh, almost constantly. So um, especially in the later half of the season when he's trying to train up Oliver the Queen as... What's the moniker that he uses? Um, Alsa him. That's the one. Yeah, basically. As the new Razagul and head of the League of Assassins and things like that. That is a thing that Razagul has always tried to do for Batman yeah. in the comics. Like, you will be my heir. You will, you know, father a son for me and so on and so forth. And the relationship with his daughter mm. sort of thing in the comics. Mm. It was Batman and Talia. Yeah. And here it's Oliver Queen and uh, Nisa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, like, I mean, the League of Assassins has always kind of represented and the temptation of Razagul's offer for Batman mm. has always been that indi indication of his incredibly strong will because obviously it would be so easy for Batman to take that and basically live forever and then do what he does right now but with limitless resources but he refuses mm. to kind of stoop to that level and compromise his morals in the same way and Oliver Queen basically goes through the exact same arc in this yeah. season so yeah in many respects it is a very faithful adaptation of the character which I did appreciate even if I'm not a hundred percent a fan of the way he was executed like all the details are still there in regards to that whole storyline, one of the things that disappoints me about it, I mm. guess, is they started off the series with Happy Arrow mm. briefly, and then immediately had to make him go back to Dark and Brooding in order to sort of fit the Batman role, mm. which I felt undid a lot of the character development he had in the very last episodes of season two yeah there's almost a resetting of the status quo that happens mm. at the beginning of season three and season four as well actually yeah. when he drives off into the sunset at the end of season three but you know within what is it four or five episodes in season four things are almost generally back to normal yeah he is back in south city in the first episode yeah yeah sure so it's just yeah it's kind of annoying i mean a lot of shows kind of do that in so many mm. respects that especially like long-running soap operas and sitcoms and such they mm. always need to maintain like a um a floating timeline of perpetually continuing the status quo so that they can continue yeah. to create stories comic books work the exact same way things mm. almost always get reset to the status quo and there can't be any sort of major change without it eventually just returning to normal just because it is a serialized and iterative medium in that respect yeah yeah and generally that's not such a bad thing i feel in this case it mm. really especially with the fact that he's in a batman storyline with a batman villain mm. makes it really obvious that this was that he started as a batman ex yeah yeah rather than actually being green arrow yeah it's very true he's still like i think i mean obviously green arrow is a character but he does especially in this season very much feel like a, a light batman or mm. a batman wannabe and they kind of force that into the role so as much as i think their interpretation of raz Ghul and what he's trying to do to oliver queen is faithful to the comics mm. i almost in some way wish that they changed it up a little bit just to distinguish it because, yeah. you know, that whole arc of Raza Ghul and looking to find an heir and things like that is something we've seen many times before, just with a slightly yeah. different character. So it's probably worth briefly talking about um, Nisa, as you sort of mentioned yes. before and such as well. So, yeah, so Nisa in the comics is called Nisa, I believe, Ratko is how you pronounced it before. I, I think R-A-T-K-O. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting spelling. In um in the comics, Nisa was born in Russia, basically. Yes. So and she's a, the illegitimate mm. daughter of Raish or Raz. Yes. And her Russian mother. Mm. So is the half sister of Talia. Yeah, exactly. Which happened, which is similar to the mm. show as well, because in the show she was born to one of Raz's concubines, wasn't she? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. So in the comics, she goes through kind of an interesting arc in that she finds Raz Ghul in like, I think the 1920s or 30s or something like that. And then her family gets 
basically captured by the Germans during World War II and get killed during the Holocaust. And then she thinks that Razagul basically abandoned her and her family and then gets really angry at him and then tries to kill him by subsequently killing Batman and Superman. It's a whole thing. And Mm -hmm. yeah, so basically she was almost an antagonist for Raz for a good while in the comics. It doesn't stay that way for very long. Eventually she kind of ends up on his side and ends up being kind of a comparable heir to Talia al Ghul. But also kind of goes with Talia, it goes against Raz, especially when he becomes a bit more genocidal Mm. Raz. And that's a whole other thing with Raz's character of him being okay with that because he feels they're going to come back again and mm. the cyclical thing and the status quo. and Yeah. But I don't think she actually does, if I'm not... I could be wrong. Doesn't kill Raz or... No, uh, doesn't go back to him. Um, I'm not sure. I may not be quite caught up to that point in the comics. Well, it's kind of hard because she sort of... She isn't heard of as much in modern comics. Well, yeah, sure. I'm thinking more when she yeah. was initially introduced, so... It yeah. was basically she went off with her own Lazarus Pit, mm. worked out how to keep using the Lazarus Pit, because up until that point, it was almost like a one-use type thing, mm. and she worked out how to just continuously use it. I think after that, she sort of fades away into the background. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so she is a fairly minor character in the mm. comics as well, but um, I do find it interesting how her sort of antagonism initially for Raz Agul in the comics is kind of paralleled in the show to some respect, yep. although obviously to a much lesser extent. Not a whole lot more to talk about regarding her. It's probably yep. worth briefly talking about the flashback villain as well, even though I, once again, almost completely forgot he existed. Yeah. Yeah, so that was General Shreve, wasn't it? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. So de- General the, the general that doesn't really appear until much later into the... <laughs> Well, yeah, there is there is a thing, Seriously. but um, in the in the comics, he's he's a very minor character as well. Really, mm. the only thing he has in common with them is that they're both from the military. Yeah. yeah, there seems to be an interesting trend with the flashback villains in that they take the name of an established but minor comic character and then kind of do what they want with them. Mm. And the guy in the flashbacks really isn't the same. To be honest, I barely remember the flashbacks for season three and season four. And I think that's one of the subsequent problems with the show is that they yep. really struggle to maintain motivation and basically justify why they're continuing to show these flashbacks in tandem with the modern day. Because, I mean, yep. they tied in so well with season two with Deathstroke that they just can't really compete with that. And it's just diminishing returns from that point onwards. So, Speaking of the flashbacks, did we want to briefly mention Katana? Uh, yeah, sure, we can. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about a whole lot because, yep. even again, in the show... It's almost a sort of name only, except mm. at one point where she dons the classic outfit mm. and said katana. Yeah. Well, it's not the Soul Taker sword. No. It is... I don't think the sword is named from what I can recall. Not that I can... Yeah, no. Yeah. It is a katana, though. That's yeah. about as much as you're going to get. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and <laughs> it does involve the death of her husband, although in this case, in the show's case, it was by her own hand, mm. uh, with a katana that... Maybe his soul got captured in. <laughs> Who knows? This is Katana. She's got my back. I'd advise not messing with her. Her soul can trap the sword of its victims. The sword of its victims? Yes. <laughs> Damn it, I completely botched that guy. You know the one from Suicide yeah. Squad that's just so abhorrently awful. Uh, which is just, just how can we describe this character that we're bringing up? Yeah, in um, the most ham fisted way this. possible. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a Suicide Squad in a later episode. But um, yeah, Katana. We're very drunk. Yes. <laughs> Katana in the um, comics, she, she, I really actually like her, to be honest, mm. from what I've been involved. Like, she was once again also involved with Batman. She's been a part of this uh, motley crew called the Outsiders, yep. which is sort of like basically outsider superhero characters involving Black Lightning and Metal Morpho. The Batman is put together as almost like sort of a, a secondary team for him that in some like respect. Almost like Black Ops. Yeah. Justice League in a sense. Like, oh, maybe not, maybe not, not, maybe not the, the level. level of Justice League, but in a similar vein, like yeah. the sort of an undercover squad in some, so many respects. They work with Batman, Batman behind the scenes, which is yeah. kind of why they're called the Outsiders. So yeah, once again, like she doesn't really have an incredible amount no. to do with the iteration in the show beyond what you've already mentioned. She, so. in the comics, is a member of the Birds of Prey um, at one point. Yeah, yeah. I almost forgot about that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's only briefly, and it's mm. mainly as a means to an end of yeah. trying to find the murderers of her husband. Mm. Uh, but there, she does share a link with uh, Black Canary. Yeah, sure. But that's really, as far as I'm aware, the yeah. closest she's gotten to connecting with Oliver Queen and the whole Green Arrow sub-universe. Yeah. Yeah, so, side note, actually, if people do enjoy Katana and want to see her in something, there's an animated TV series called Beware the Batman, where she basically plays the role of Robin, and she's really, really freaking good. And the show is great as well, and I don't, it's a shame because it was cancelled after one season and everything, but I really like it. 
I should probably do an episode on one day, actually, because I think it's really cool to talk about. But yeah, side note, if you do enjoy Katana and mm-hmm. if you want to know more about her than whatever Suicide Squad did to her, <laughs> watch that show because she's probably the best character in the entire series and I think she's great. So yeah. yeah. I, I'm, gl- I'm glad you brought Katana up because to be honest, like the show, I almost completely forgot she existed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Is there anything well, else? Well, she was one of the also characters that ended up having to be shelled because mm. of the Suicide Squad movie. Oh, yeah. I almost Along completely forgot about Task that Task Force well. X yeah. and characters like Deadshot. True. Did we want to briefly touch on Task Force X? Like, we mentioned Deadshot in the previous episode. Yeah. But, I mean, this version of Suicide Squad is, once again, fairly familiar to the one that they have. Can They They don't even call themselves Suicide Squad. They bring it up. Mm. It's like Deadshot as an offhand remark. It's like, what do we... So we're just some sort of Suicide Squad, yeah. basically. Yeah. Which the movie then subsequently whipped off, funnily enough. Yeah. It's still a terrible Weird. line, though, but yes. sure. But uh, unlike the movie, the show doesn't seem to dwell on it. Yeah. And they're just known as Task Force X, which they are in the comics as yes. well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Lines up pretty well in mm. to the comics in the sense that it is just a rotating group of villains Lo- under Argus's control. Yeah, largely headed by Amanda Waller, basically, to yep. just go out and do her dirty work. So um, there has been a number of iterations of Suicide Squad in the comics before Amanda Waller took it over, mm. but that's really the version that everyone knows yep. because of the movies and subsequent animated series and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. And yes. um, once again, as you sort of, we've sort of been touching on briefly, the reason that Task Force X and Deadshot became less prominent as the series went on was because of the Suicide Squad mm-hmm. movie. So, Which ends yep. with... Deadshot dying, Katana dying in the show. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, no, and Amanda Waller herself dying. Mm. Yeah, true. Do we want to touch on Amanda Waller briefly? Uh, yeah. Because she does become, like, a more prominent character outside of just the Suicide Squad and Task Force X episodes and everything like that, so. She does, but there isn't a whole lot to actually talk about, aside from her being head of Argus. Yeah. And I don't really like this version of kind of a at dick. All. Yeah. Which is like her comics, but less of weirdly hmm. less of a like yeah this is a this is just a weak source version of amanda yeah. waller basically like amanda waller is always like her nickname is the wall because mm. nothing can because basically she's the immovable object of the dc universe that she's always looking to get away and such and she has like one-on-one will battles with batman like it's mm. that sort of level of character but in this she's just yeah just a wet blanket honestly yeah. i barely like I don't think the actress is incredibly well cast. I feel like you could have gotten someone with a greater presence. I don't think the writing is really there, and she's largely a supporting character as well. So I just think just kind of not great all around. The one time I actually in, properly enjoyed watching her performance and the way they wrote her mm. was the episode where she died <laughs> and made and they made her sympathetic, yeah. which I liked, but is the mm. most far away from the comics yeah, as no. you can get i feel dirty even thinking about mm. the idea of being sympathetic for amanda oh, waller yeah. to be honest so yeah which, as... which is saying something when that's the most impressive part <laughs> of her, her entire run of this show yeah sure. is when she's least like the character she's meant to be that's a good point yeah so it's uh <laughs> not much more to talk about there i think no um well unless there's anything else you want to briefly touch on regarding season three i guess we better get into the big one of Season four. Let's see what else we can talk about in season three. <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's hold off for as long as possible. We need to eventually. Uh-huh. Like, we've already been recording for a good long while. This is going to be a hefty episode. Yeah. Yeah, we need to move on. Like, if you want, we'll start season four by talking about the villain, which is more tolerable. I guess. Yeah. You're still giving me a look, but we, we well, need, we need to Well, because I know how it. this ends. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. I will admit, mm. Neil McDonough... Mm. as Damien Dark yeah. was incredibly entertaining. He is, even if his character is really weirdly written and the villain isn't good at all, Neil McDonough just makes things better. <laughs> He's kind of one of those people. We've, we have a lot of touchstones as we've been going through this uh, podcast series mm. of like actors that, even if they're in terrible things, if they're there, it makes things a little bit better, like mm. Brandon Routh and Chris Evans and so on. Neil McDonough is one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he he just seems to be having so much fun oh, yeah. with the role. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, in so many respects, he's here for the paycheck, but he's also going to have a great time yes. getting that paycheck. So, yeah, mm. he's he's really good in performance. <laughs> Not so much in anything else, I guess. Um, mm. If we want to talk about Demi and Dark from the comics briefly, there isn't really a whole lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, he was uh, a minor character who first appeared in 1999 as an enemy of the Teen Titans, surprisingly. Mm. Once again, kind of like Deathstroke. He, they've yeah. been stealing a lot of Teen Titan villains. 
which is a little bit weird. I don't know if that's intentional or anything, but um, yeah, in um, in that version, he was much younger, uh, also immortal, because he's kind of using the Lazarus Pit to his own ends, which is yep. similar to his connection to the League of Assassins yep. in the comics, in the show, sorry. Yeah, and um, he's also tech-based rather than magic. Yes. As far as I'm aware, he has no affiliation with any sort of magical... Uh, Not that I've read in the comics, aside from the magic mm. that's involved in the League of Assassins mm. and the Lazarus. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it's very much that... Even that magic is very much science magic. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, we can do this thing with yep. a little bit of... Yeah, we have a vaguely... Wavium. We have a vaguely rational explanation <laughs> for this that doesn't make sense if you think about it, but sure. Mm. Because comics. Yes. But, um, yeah, so he is affiliated with Hive in the comics as well, because Hive has longstandingly been an antagonist of the Teen Titans too. Yeah. Uh, although in the Hive in the comics is much different in that they're kind of... Almost like, I keep going for the Marvel equivalents, but I guess because the MCU is so popular, people are more likely to be aware of these touchstones. Mm. They're kind of like the the equivalent of Hydra in many ways for the yeah. DC universe. And they're, they're just kind of a group of, it's a long-standing organization full of assassins that are basically trying to take over the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, very psychological based, I think was one yeah. of the things that gets brought up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, it doesn't have an incredible amount in common with the hive of the show no, no. beyond just the name and it is a, once again affiliated with Damien Dark but yeah it's it's just kind of a sinister organization that um has hired Deathstroke in the comics to kill the Teen Titans before and things like yeah. that so yeah so that's that's kind of it so um in the it it has a really weird origin in the comics because I think it was along the lines of someone found alien technology and then used it to create some sort of advanced civilization which led to creating a council of seven which led to the foundation of hive and so on and so forth yeah. it's a really weird convoluted backstory that has no relevance to the show but i did find it interesting yeah so in that respect it's kind of raza ghul is very much the outlier in the villains we've talked about so far and mm -hmm. that he's largely comics accurate and that the rest are taking a name from the comics but taking it in a very different direction and damien dark is no exception like yeah. once again he's one of those characters that is almost in essentially an original character considering yeah. how much they changed from the original comics so do you have mm. um any opinions on his on the their choice to turn him into a magic user in some respects um, not a whole lot when you look at the magic side of the dc comics universe mm. there's a lot you can sort of dig into if you so far especially when they took over things like um dark horse and vertigo sure uh, and that and started integrating characters like Constantine into the mainline universe mm. and uh, characters like Felix Faust and mm. all this other stuff. You could have potentially gone for one of those characters to be a magic user, but at the same time, none of them would have fit that huge big bad with an army of henchmen mm. where Damien Dark would have. So, look, yeah, the idea of the totem makes sense, but I feel that really you could have picked anyone who has a sort of big organization gave them one of the totems and it would have worked yeah sure like it, i feel like they almost chose damien dark almost completely randomly as a name or a mm -hmm. character to be based on they just kind of wanted a magic user and then that's why he's yeah. almost incur inherently an original character this is i i don't know if we've necessarily touched on this so far but there is an interesting arc in our the television series how it starts as like you know fairly grounded batman begins nolan-esque but as the series has been going on each season, they've just been steadily addling more and more fantastical elements. Mm. Like there was the Mirakura in season three, then the Lazarus Pit. Sorry, the Mirakura in season two, the Lazarus Pit in season three, and then full on magic in season four. And that kind of matches the mm. expansion of the universe with Flash and the Legends tomorrow and such. But it just yeah. does feel like this season was the one where it truly got almost to an absurd level of comic bookiness with what was going oh, on. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I. I don't, I don't mind that kind of transition because most comic mm. book properties which start off grounded end up becoming more inherently ridiculous as they yeah. go on. That's and it just... would have made less sense for it to have remained grounded, especially now that we've introduced mm. the crossovers with Flash and Legends yeah. and Supergirl exactly. and Constantine. Mm. Yeah, well, once like Flash is going parallel with metahumans every other mm. week and traveling to other dimensions and time travel and such. like Reality it, is thrown out the window at yeah, that point. Yeah, exactly. Like It feels weird literally just to a, a city over that they're still dealing with like yeah. street-level thugs. So, yeah, that kind of escalation of um, not only world-building but also stakes kind of makes sense in so many respects. Yeah. That's... Um, but how they treat those stakes uh, and how they combat those heightened dangers 
Really probably could have been done better. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I mean, we've already talked about this already, but season four in so many respects is just not good on a purely like construction level, like writing level, character level, stakes. <laughs> Everything mm-hmm. is just kind of just a little bit of a mess, if we're being honest. This is also the most soap opera level of the show has ever been which is once again one of the reasons that i dislike this season so much funnily enough but even just on top of that even the the elements that i'm normally more interested in which is the um you know the comic booky elements and the procedural stuff just isn't any good like the fact that demi and dark's like whole idea is to create another nuclear apocalypse Mm -hmm. and then starts Mm -hmm. a civilization with this underground bunker of suburbicon place where everything's like kind of weirdly perfect and pleasantville-esque it's just so bizarre Mm. and the fact that they end the season finale by like oliver motivating the people of star city to destroy his magical powers because suddenly he's like a hero of the people because of course just it's really bad (laughs) and that's not even getting into all the love interest felicity oh she's crippled oh she's not crippled anymore stuff so or the whole let's blow up haven rock because I can't hack the one <sighs> nuclear weapon. Hold on, now I can hack all of them and send them into space. Yep. The next episode. Of course. The Deus Ex yeah. Hackama of the um, Arrow universe. Whatever Felicity can do with that computer. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't even a computer, just a tablet. Well, yeah, sure. It could Seriously, be, when. She could be doing it with her mind and it wouldn't even matter at this point, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. If, if they mm. suddenly explained that she was in Central City during the particle mm. explosion, mm. it would make things more make more sense. <laughs> That's true, actually. It would resolve a lot of things, funnily enough. I've never thought about that. So it just kind of gets to the point where the writing is really not only lazy, but also just genuinely bad in so many respects. Yeah. And this is like, I've never like... On, I, I don't know if I've ever seen uh, a fandom for a show like just generally revile the season as much as I have. Are you talking others. about the fact that the Arrow subreddit on Reddit <laughs> gave up and became a Daredevil subreddit? Yeah, yeah, there, there was that. People hated the show so much that they basically stopped talking about it. And then was it for like a week or so? I don't quite remember. Uh, I think it was a bit longer. It actually. might have been a month maybe. But they yeah. basically changed all the logos to Daredevil and they're all talking about Daredevil and such. And I, I'm pretty sure still the top rated post on that subreddit is um, a picture of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. saying, "Is if this bec- if this reaches the front page, we have truly lost all faith in this show. And it has like 10,000 enough votes or something like that. It's yeah. just ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, it was divisive <laughs> yeah oh funnily enough that whole blowback is the most entertaining thing i find about this season <laughs> yes yeah uh my biggest problem and this relates to both season three and mainly season four i think can sort of be summed up by these mm. three things which are kind of linked themselves so it's sort of one thing mm. but three things uh but it's essentially their main issues are dramatic tension mm. story progression and story potential mm. and chekhov's gun <laughs> <laughs> basically or Chekhov's bow in this respect <laughs> yes hey basically their biggest issue was the fact that they would set up all these potentially good ideas mm. and then not follow through with them at all mm. or they'd write something and not know where they were going with it mm. the biggest example of this is what i hate the most is the grave the grave of season four where the first episode they flash forward six months and show someone oh, is dead and buried. That's right. Uh, and it comes up twice again in the season. Mm. So what they did, they've mentioned this on interviews as well. Mm. They wrote a grave because they thought it'd be an interesting plot point. They didn't know who was in it when they first <laughs> wrote this. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> and it became less of a who can we write compellingly to finish off their arc and have them in the grave and more just mm. who's left mm. who can we logically put in the grave so that we haven't written ourselves into a corner basically yeah essentially yeah. and that's sort of where they mess with Chekhov's gun if you introduce something in the first act mm. it needs to be resolved and used in the third act yeah that's that's the whole concept of Chekhov's gun yeah. basically so um yeah it's uh i, I don't remember if a ex- gun is shown in the in act one mm. of a th- play 
then by Act Three, it must go off. Yes, it must be. That's fired. essentially what it is. Yeah, yeah. I um, I, I can actually speak to this because I've been doing a little bit of reading on um. I've mentioned it before, mm. my, but my PhD is basically on narratology, and um, one of the main things of narrative uh narrative construction is causality where mm. things are created in a way that have high redundancy meaning that every detail is intentional and leads into the next and so on and so forth like there's this basically perpetual system between real life which is utter chaos and then narrative which is essentially creating organized causality out of that chaos and then narratives tend to exist on the spectrum in that respect so mm. green uh, arrow <laughs> in previous seasons have typically adhered to that level of causality of you know setting up something paying it off things logically making sense but that cause it causality is so frequently and perpetually broken in ways that don't really work in a narrative sense in season four that it just breaks the entire series breaks the entire season so absolutely yeah and there's also another mm. concept uh, when it comes to narrative mm. is dramatic tension, mm. which, as you know, is when a piece of information is shown either to the audience, mm. uh, but not shown to the characters or vice versa. Yeah. The audience is put in a privileged position, meaning yeah. you have anticipation of what's going to happen, but the characters don't. Yes. Yeah. In some cases, it can be known as the characters having privileged information on certain things and the audience not knowing, and mm. that's how you get surprises yeah. and twists mm -hmm. in this particular case though they really mess it up and the th the one that i made my main example for this is the second instance of the grave mm. in which you just had the christmas season mid-season finale where you've just watched felicity get shot by about 10 bullets mm. uh, and clearly not in a good way they then cut to the grave, which would be interesting, potentially foreshadowing or something. But then Oliver gets in a limo and there's Felicity alive and well. Mm. And so all that tension just immediately evaporates. Because <laughs> yeah. you're like, oh, okay, now there we mm. know exactly mm. that she's going to be fine. There mm. is no stakes in this anymore. There is no tension. Mm. We know what's going to happen. Yeah. and It's inherently meaningless what happens between the point of her being shot and that point now. Because yes. we know where it's going to inevitably end up. So, I mean, broadly speaking, like, stories can still work in that respect mm. when you know where things are going to lead up. Like, some prequels can still be good and so on and so forth. But yeah. in this respect, it fundamentally just means the show is less motivating and interesting to watch. Yeah, basically. Yeah. it All that information <clears throat> that was shown to the audience basically boils down to, yeah, Felicity's fine. Don't worry about it. Mm. Which, when you're going into a mid-season finale and mm. using that as a cliffhanger, doesn't work. Mm. It's like they try to tell everyone that everyone's gonna, everything's going to be fine, but like, ooh, how is it going to be fine? <laughs> doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, in some stories it can work, but mm. in this one in it this absolutely one, no. did not. Absolutely not. Yeah, no, it just doesn't pay off. And, you know, just like, okay, now we're more like, we're just <laughs> narrowing down the list of potential dead bodies. Mm. Yeah. Even though by about midway through the second half, everyone knows who it's going to be. Yeah, which leads into uh, one thing that I know <sighs> you feel very strongly about regarding this season, which ends up being who is in that grave. Yeah. Uh, would you would you care to enlighten the viewers who may not be aware? By the end of the season, it is revealed that w who is dead and buried is basically the show itself <laughs> because they put Laurel in the box. <laughs> and why is this such a bad thing? <laughs> Uh, because she, at this point, had become the one redeeming character out of all of this. Mm. <laughs> they actually, in not caring about her for two seasons, mm. basically, they ended up giving her the only consistent character development <laughs> <laughs> in the entire show. Her character finally starts to pay off in season four. Yes. Until that point. <laughs> In fact, the only time they cared about her is the one episode where she does die, and she becomes such a good character <laughs> in that one episode. Mm. Just really hurts you more when mm. they end up basically fridging her just to make Damien Duck look kind of bad again yeah. because they messed up mm. his entire build-up, basically. Mm. Yeah. That's a, that's a real good point. Mm. And even as, as we were talking about at the beginning of this episode regarding Black Canary and how she's always been intimately connected with Green Arrow, I look, I know we, we always talk about in regards to adaptations that mm. people's prior experience to what, um, what something new is based on should 
inform and not detract on your experience like you should be open mm. to things being changed which you know we're always talking yes. about and things like and that. and this has happened in past adaptations mm. of green arrow in mm. smallville a similar thing happened where green arrow didn't end up getting together with black canary mm. but that didn't matter as much because they still sort of made it work yeah and black canary was not such an integral part of green arrow story to begin with unlike in arrow where it's the two of them from the beginning mm. set up as the main interest yeah cool things can change but when you mess up fundamentally like this you're gonna piss off a lot of people yeah yeah including okay. myself yeah no i know i've heard uh, many a rant regarding this uh mm. this unfortunate turn of events Conf- yeah, i'm sorry about that just every no, time <laughs> no it's fine i understand it's it's an interesting yeah. insight but uh yeah that um in many respects kind of also epitomizes Along with Felicity, where the show mm. is at at this point. And one of the things that I really hate about it, just to continue my rant for a okay. little bit longer, because okay. this links back to dramatic tension, uh, story potential, and Chekhov's gun. Uh-huh. The reason she dies mm. is because, essentially, they destroy Damien Duck's magic totem, mm. and he suddenly loses all magic. Mm. There is a lot, there's a lot of interesting potential in that uh, scenario now. He still has his cooperation, but he's now not so overpowered Mm. that there is now a weakness a few episodes later they give him back his magic totem he then becomes op again freezes everyone Mm. stabs laurel purely just to get back at quinton lance Mm. who had sort of betrayed him earlier in the season and that's it Mm. and he's back to where he was before they destroyed the totem nothing was gained Mm. and there was lost potential in so much interesting once narrative. again they once again they set up something that it doesn't pay off yeah because it just returns to where it was immediately at that point yeah, yeah so yeah really not good so there was no point to her death which makes things even worse doesn't it yes yeah okay um is there anything else we want to talk about in regards to season four um, I, we do there is a couple of supporting characters that we haven't properly touched on yet regarding mm. um roy and thea yes or uh, do, do we want to save thea for next episode uh up to you i have yeah. plenty that i can talk about in mm. regards to Thea, and it does make sense given that mm. she is speedy up until the end of season four, and then she's just back to being Thea. Yeah, sure, makes and sense. So, we'll briefly bring it up Thea is essentially an original character mm. in this uh, show. Like she is, many others, yeah. yeah, but she's heavily inspired by the character of Mia Durden mm. uh, to the point where her middle name is Durden in the show. Mia Durden was uh, brought in during Kevin Smith's run of Green Arrow. Uh, volume 3 in 2001 as just someone who the green arrow saves from a exploitation sex slave ring while she is quite young and basically lets her live with him and sort of brings her back to her feet she ends up learning how to become an archer through him and through connor hawk and roy harper as they're all sort of coming back together and eventually becomes uh, the character of Speedy, uh, taking over from Roy Harper's role as he off- becomes awesome and goes off on his own adventures. Mm, okay. Yeah, it's basically it. But there is no like familial connection regarding Mia to no. Oliver in the comics? Okay. There is not. Yep. However, there's an interesting point to this mm. because it's, this is what I like to call recursive adaptation mm. in the fact that Mia was created... Thea was then inspired, but adjusted, based on Mia. They, in the comics, then brought in Emiko Queen, who Mm. is uh, basically an adaptation of Thea Queen from the show. Emiko Queen is the surprise half-sister of Green Arrow, who, I think, the love child of Robert Queen and Shadow. Oh, really? And then there's a whole thing in the comics about lineage and stuff. Yeah, sure. And she starts off fighting against Green Arrow, but then joins his side Mm. and basically becomes the next Speedy in that line. So you have Mia Mm. being adapted into a TV show, then into Thea, and then Thea being adapted into Emiko Queen in the comics. And then Emiko in season seven gets adapted into the show again. (laughs) Surprise. So, yes. A very interesting recursive adaptation mm, yeah. yeah oh well, we sort of touched on it before we're getting like a symbiotic relationship mm. between the comics influencing the show influencing the comics and so on and so forth yeah but i feel this yeah. is where it's clearest and i really enjoy it yeah yeah sure sir yeah and in regards to thea in the show i find she's probably one of the better characters sure 
Yeah. <laughs> she's fine, honestly. Yeah. I've never felt very strongly about her, to be honest, one way or another. Well, she's one of the characters that sort of falls to the wayside in later seasons. Mm, and in happen. doing so, again, gets better character development. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah, because they don't care about her. And so she just sort of fills a role. And that role is actually weirdly more in sync as the sister of Oliver. And, like, there's less drama involved, which makes sense for me. Like, when it's revealed in season three that... uh, Revealed to Thea that Oliver is the arrow, she just hugs him. That's it. There's no whole dealing into the secrets thing and the whole... Mm. Like almost every other character. Yeah, why did you keep from this, this from me? Mean, why are you trying are you to kill me? Blah, 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 She's blah. She's just like, you saved all those people. You mm. saved my boyfriend. Mm. Thank you. Mm. And I thought that was really sweet. It's a nice and also, moment. one of the few people to have a proper relationship that makes sense <laughs> in her relationship with Roy Harper. Sure, that's true. Yeah, do we want to talk briefly about Roy as well? We've already sort of mentioned him, obviously. Sure. Roy Harper is Arsenal. Mm. Arsenal in the comics is the first uh, speedy mm. for Green Arrow. He he's, grew up... he's Green Arrow's Robin, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah, if we're going to use shorthand. Grew up in a uh, Native American reserve. Oh, I didn't know that. He was adopted. Okay. That's where he learned his archery yeah, skills. Cool. And then basically gets brought in by Green Arrow as his ward. Mm. Very Robin-esque. Mm. Uh, and then they have a few issues and they end up parting ways again like the first robin and batman Mm -hmm. but both more wholesome and more like hard because (laughs) one of the reasons is arsenal basically is a recovering drug addict Mm. Uh, there's a really significant story from the 80s isn't it yes when green arrow and green lantern which had an ongoing storyline together basically found out that Roy Harbour was addicted to heroin, yep. wasn't it? Yeah, which was an incredibly significant thing yep. at the time because it was very rare for comics to deal with like serious issues mm. like that. Yeah. Especially, and whenever like drug users were brought up, it was very much junky scum kind of. Mm. These are just people who are naturally going to fall into these Just things. wasting away their lives, Wasting. yeah, of course. And this was like, oh no, this drug addiction can happen to anyone mm. no matter how well off they are or how nice they are. Mm. It could still happen. And it was one of those things where it was used as a launching ground to actually discuss in a more reasonable setting mm. for this audience, which, funnily enough, gets mirrored in the next BD in Mia Durden because she later comes out as HIV positive. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. And that was then also back when it was a bit more of a taboo subject. Mm, yeah. And again, did the same thing that Roy Harper did for drugs, me did for the AIDS epidemic. Yeah, sure. Yep. So in, in many ways, like mm-hmm. Roy Harper is an interestingly significant character to comic book history. Oh yeah, he's yep. very much linked in with the Arrow family. Mm, yeah, Especially sure. even now in the modern uh, Rebirth series, mm. he has come back to... Yeah help green arrow is he known as red arrow now or arsenal he's mainly known as arsenal okay I, I but he also does occasionally names. go by red arrow it's okay depends on which continuity you're looking at yeah sure essentially yeah no fair enough but yeah he's one mm. of the ones that is sort of stuck by even mm. if they have gone their separate ways mm. arsenal went off and did things with uh, red hood mm. uh, and red hood and the outlaws wasn't it cool yes yeah, and then yep eventually red hood and arsenal and mm. they just did a duo thing oh cool enough. i didn't hear about that one yeah mm. uh, it was basically because they took out starfire to let her do her own thing in somewhere else yeah sure so yeah that is essentially arsenal very very major part of green arrow mm. yeah cool and fairly similar in the show yeah in many respects oh. yeah aside from the drug problem which they mm. gave to thea instead yeah, Which sure. Makes sense. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Interesting choice, but I think it worked at the yeah. very least and gave us something to do for a good while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, which was nice. But um, yeah, so mm. when exactly does he leave again? I don't quite recall. In the show? Yeah. In the comics? In the show. In the show. He basically takes the rap for being the arrow. Oh, uh, after that's right. Raz Algo reveals it to Quentin Lance mm. and then fakes his death. That's so right. everyone thinks Arrow is dead, and yeah. he goes off to live as Jason somewhere else. Sure, sure. I couldn't quite remember what exactly the details were for it. Yeah, mm. so and which I, he keeps coming back. Yeah, well, yeah. I believe that like was the one comics. Of, I believe that was one of the things where he essentially just wanted to pursue other shows, didn't he? Largely? I think it was actually to deal with his. It was Colton Haynes, mm. who is fantastic. Who's an uh, actor? Yeah, was dealing with a lot of like a major anxiety issues and depression, oh, and okay. him coming mm. out at the time. Yeah, sure. So he just needed to 
time off basically yeah yeah which was great for him yeah mm. and i think they did a fairly decent job of handling that in the show yes. it, i mean even if it did feel kind of sudden in that respect but you can understand why it would be in those yeah. circumstances but yeah yeah no it was good i think it was worth sort of touching on those supporting characters considering you know major parts of the show that we hadn't really discussed yet yeah. just trying to keep it all very <laughs> fast paced because this is getting along yeah, we, we're getting into hefty episodes. Oh, that's one of the things yeah. that happens with, you know, television series, especially when there's so much more content to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult to condense things down. Even in these couple of episodes, we're yeah. still missing so many other additional characters and, you know, storylines and so on and so forth. It's just yeah. impossible to touch on everything. Not as once we- did we talk about Clock King. <laughs> as much as I would love to do a whole episode on Clock King and his, all mm. his different iterations, that would be delightful. <laughs> what if we did like a, a character themed episode at some point in the future, looking at all That'd the different versions of like a, a like a minor character or something? That'd be cool. Yeah. That's not a bad calendar idea. Calendar Man. Ca- yeah, exactly. We could do Calendar Man. I would 100% <laughs> be on board with that. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll pencil that in for later down the line. Yeah. But um, yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about regarding season four before we move into do it differently? And... No, the further we can get away from this se- <laughs> season, the better, okay. in my opinion. Fair enough. Well, if you we want to move into uh, do it differently then. Jingle, jingle, jingle. 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 Okay. So uh, this episode, we're actually going to be trying something a little bit different and separating out the do it differently section of this into a separate bonus episode, considering Evan is uh, so incredibly invested in the amount of things that he wants to change in Arrow Season 3 and 4, which means uh, we will now be moving into random talk. So what exactly we are looking to talk about or recommend this episode? What have you got for us, Evan? Well, I'm continuing the theme of Green Arrow graphic novels that you should read. Okay. Uh, Thematically appropriate. (laughs) Yes. Well, I did it last week with year one. So continuing thematically appropriate. (laughs) Yes. Uh, This week, I'm going to... One I mentioned earlier Mm. in Kevin Smith's Quiver. Oh, that's the early 2000s one, isn't it? Yes. The one that introduced Mia Durden Mm. as a character and brought Green Arrow back from the dead. So if you're a Green Arrow fan, you'll probably know about it anyway. It's probably one of the more acclaimed runs of yeah. the modern age. Mm. If you don't know about it, it's basically Green Arrow, back from the dead, has a weird case of amnesia mm. and is trying to sort out his life. And it's a very nice reintroduction of all these past characters. You have Black Canary, Arsenal, Connor Hawk, who is the son of Green Arrow. Mm-hmm. That was also briefly mentioned in the show, but also not Connor Hawk, and also on Legends, and it's confusing. Sure, sure. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's very, it's very fun. It's a throwback to a more sort of silver and golden age of Green Arrow, mm. that sort of era, and it's just a lot of enjoyable fun with a lot of sort of darker undercurrents and stories and conspiracies underneath, which I find really interesting. It deals with both street-level crime and with the more magical side of the DC universe. So it's it's basically a much better season four. Well, granted, that's not very hard to do, to be honest. But no. it's still, appreciative, yeah. yeah. I um, I know bits and pieces about what Kevin Smith's writing has done in comics and such, and I think I have might have heard of that before, but yeah, it sounds quite interesting, to be honest. I might have to add it to my list as well. Yeah, you don't have a copy I can borrow, do you? Yes, I can give you one. Oh, do you? Oh, Of course, cool. it's Green Arrow. Of course I have a copy. I should have expected that, to be honest. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, for, um, for my recommendation this episode, I'm actually going to go back to my usual chain (laughs) my usual chain of just recommending weird movies that people haven't heard of before and uh this one i'm actually going to be going for a spanish film called open your eyes Mm. Uh, i believe it was released in the mid 90s i watched it recently for my phd and it was actually um remade in america in the early 2000s by cameron crowe in a film called vanilla sky might be an interesting one to talk about later down the line actually Mm. but um it's a difficult film to talk about because in trying to recommend it, I would implicitly try and compare it to other films, but in comparing it to other films, it would be to spoil this film. So let me just say it basically follows this sort of vaguely misogynistic playboy who's going around sleeping with whatever, with whatever woman he wants and things like that uh, until a terrible accident basically happens to him and all these really strange events begin to unravel in his life. It's not like it's not amazing, but there's enough interesting plotting in there and really interesting ideas and themes and good performances and such with a really great ending that I would absolutely recommend uh, people check out. But it's just one of those really difficult things because the less you know about about it going in, the better it is. 
which makes it really hard to actually encourage people to watch it. But just take, take my word for it. You're probably going to find it quite interesting. And it's a hell of a lot better than the American remake, big surprise. So mm. if you're going to watch a version of it, don't watch Vanilla Sky. Watch Spanish's Open Your Eyes. Yeah. Yes. I will admit with the synopsis you just mentioned, my mm. immediate thought was, oh, it's Iron Man. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Mm. Don't go into it thinking that. But um, <laughs> yeah, he's, see, it, the problem is it is like, like a... It's very similar to a number of films that I know people love, but in telling people what those films are will immediately spoil where it's going to go, so I just can't do it. So, yeah. Fair enough. Check it out. Open your eyes. It's really good. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who listened to this episode on Medium Shift, where you can, as always, be found at mediumshift at gmail.com. Feel free to send in your personal thoughts on Arrow Season 1 to 4 thus far, and your own do it differently if you so desire as well. It's always interesting hearing how people would change and, you know, in many respects, reprove on what is generally considered one of the worst seasons of the entire series. So, Look, you can send us just a keyboard smash. <laughs> And still have a better script than what we got for season four. So. <laughs> yeah, fair, exactly. So, uh, yeah, next episode, we're going to be continuing this and finishing off with Arrow season five and season six. So until next time, fare thee well. Bye. <laughs>